Welcome back to the lab. Now today, I want to talk about the concept of moment of inertia, or MOI, and also discuss a simple apparatus that can be used to measure the moment of inertia on various objects. Now, as usual, before we get started, I want to dip into the physics just a little bit. Okay, so let's take a look at some basic concepts associated with the moment of inertia. Now recall that inertia is a property of matter and that inertia is a resistance to a change in motion. So a mouse riding on a skateboard has a certain inertia and it makes it relatively easy to stop him. However, if we put an elephant on the skateboard, the elephant's inertia is much greater and thus will be more difficult to stop him. Now, moment of inertia involves a moment. So a moment is created when a force is applied at some distance from a point of rotation, which results in a torque. Now, moment of inertia is also known as rotational inertia. And the moment of inertia can be thought of as a resistance moment that is caused by mass elements being distributed at one or more radii from some point of rotation where the torque is applied. So keep those things in mind. Now let's take a look at the concept of a moment and what I mean by a resistive moment. Now, in this graphic, I depict a moment. I've got a two kilogram mass, which if I multiply that mass times acceleration of gravity, I get a downward force. It's attached to a beam, which is then attached to a rotation point, point A. Now that a downward force acting at a distance from point A creates a clockwise moment that wants to make the system rotate in the clockwise direction. Now if I expand that diagram and add another mass to the other side, and I have those two masses equal distance from point B, the system initially will not want to rotate. However, if I apply a torque around point B, I can try to get the system to start rotating in a clockwise direction. If I apply that torque, I'll get a rotational acceleration. However, the inertia of the two kilogram masses resists my attempts to accelerate the system in the clockwise direction. So that anti-clockwise moment is my resistive moment. Now, here I have two systems. And these systems have both the same total mass. However, they have different rotational inertias. The top diagram shows my system where I have two masses at a long distance from the center point, And that system has a higher moment of inertia. Now, if I move those two masses inward towards the CG, the inertia will be less. Now, it'll be more difficult to accelerate the system on the top diagram and a little easier to accelerate the system in the lower diagram due to the lower moment of inertia. All right, what I have here is a simple homemade rotational inertia rod or an MOI rod. Now what it is is essentially a piece of uh, PVC pipe with two blocks of wood attached to the ends. And uh, the blocks of wood are equal distance from the center of my PVC pipe. So what I can do is by hand is twist this back and forth and kind of get a feel for how the rod behaves and get an idea of what the inertia feels like. Now, here's my second rotational inertia rod. Same as the first, so the mass is the same. Same PVC pipe, same wooden blocks. However, the blocks are closer together. And so the rotational inertia, or the MOI, is smaller on this particular rig. And so it's a lot easier to twist back and forth. So again, a low MOI, or rotational inertia, and a higher MOI, or rotational inertia. Again, I can get a feel by twisting these on what the rotational inertias feel like. Now, let's take a look at some basic equations that allow us to calculate the MOI of some simple shapes. Now let's take a look at some very basic shapes and the equations used to calculate their moments of inertia. Now I have multiple configurations here. I've got essentially a block, a cylinder, a sphere, and a narrow rod. Now if you examine these equations, you notice that they're all a function of the square of the length dimensions. So as the radius of these things increase or they get bigger, the inertia increases by the square of the change of those dimensions. Now let's take a look at how I can actually measure the MOI using my simple bifilar torsional pendulum. Here's what a simple bifilar pendulum looks like. I have two strings attached to the ceiling, in this case. They go down and attach to my test article. Now, a bifilar pendulum is a simple torsional pendulum. Now, gravity provides a torque once the test article is set into a torsional oscillation, twisting back and forth. The period of oscillation is measured and used to calculate the moment of inertia. Now here's a simplified diagram of the system. I need to know the length of the strings, 
I need to know the distance between the two strings. And those two strings are centered about the center of gravity of the test article. I need to know the mass of the test article. Now this system will measure the moment of inertia about the object's center of gravity. Now here's the equation for calculating the moment of inertia. I have a distance squared times the object's weight times the period squared divided by 16 pi squared times the length of the strings. Now here are the parameters and the units that are used. Distance is in meters, weight is in newtons, period will be in seconds, length will be in meters, and of course pi, 3.1417. Now let's do a unit analysis to check the equation. So here are my units put in for the parameters. I have the second squareds cancel out. These two distances in meters cancel out. I end up with simply kilograms meters squared. And so that's the units of moment of inertia, and those are indeed the right units. Here's my bifilar pendulum setup. I've got two vertical members clamped to my table and a cross beam. And at 90 degrees to this cross beam, I've got another smaller beam, which I've attached my two strings to. These are the suspension strings going down to the test article. And you can see the test article here if I turn it sideways. Now, I've got a small bubble level to make sure my object is level for testing. And then what we simply do is uh, using a stopwatch, we can get the system oscillating. Then start the stopwatch at an extreme deflection and then count two, three, four oscillations and time it and then divide appropriately to get the time for one oscillation. So this is a basic, simple bifilar torsional pendulum. Here's what I mean by one complete oscillation. I'm going to start the test with the block deflected, and one oscillation is a swing to this direction, then all the way back to the original starting point. So that would be one oscillation. So let's go ahead and take a look at it in action here. Now in this setup, I've got relatively short strings, so the period is relatively quick. If I make longer strings, like hang this from the ceiling, I get a longer period, and it might be a little easier to measure. Now, before we make the actual MOI measurement, let's go ahead and calculate the theoretical MOI for our wooden test block. Here's how I will calculate the theoretical MOI for the wooden test block. I like using a 2x4 because the wood is somewhat homogeneous, and the rectangular nature of the block makes the calculations relatively easy. Now over to the left hand side at the bottom, we see the parameters for the wooden block. It has a mass of 0.9 kilograms, a width of 0.04 meters, and a length of 0.5 meters. Now here's the equation I'll be using to calculate the MOI. It's 1 12th times the mass times the width squared plus length squared. So if I put the parameters into the equation, you see that I get an MOI of 0.0181 kilograms meters squared. Now you see I have quite a few significant figures and all of those are not necessary. But I will be comparing this to the actual measured MOI We now carry out the same significant figures so you can get an idea of how close these numbers come together. Now we're ready to make the measurements on our actual test article, our wooden block. Get my stopwatch ready, put an initial deflection in the test article. Three, two, one, start. One, two, three. Okay, so our three oscillations. I got about 3.44 seconds for three oscillations. So I divide that by three to get the time it takes for one oscillation. Now, you might think the initial deflection angle of the test article comes into play on the period. However, it's not true. It's a pendulum, just like your regular swing pendulum. It doesn't matter where I release the ball from, it actually moves and sweeps out the same period. So let's try to prove that by putting in more deflection here and then making a test. Three, two, one, release. One, two, three. So there I got 3.5 seconds. Now that's a little bit higher than the previous test. However, I got to make multiple tests to take an average because starting and stopping the stopwatch is not very precise. So again, no matter how I deflect the test article, the period will be the same for this particular setup. Here's the data I collected from my experiment. Now, I only did five trials in the interest of time. You should probably do 10, maybe even 15 trials to make sure you get a good average period. Now, what I did was I measured three oscillations and you see the times that I got in the middle column. I divided that time by three to 
give me the period of oscillation. And you see that the average period was 1.12 seconds. So now what I did was I took that time and the various dimensions associated with my test and put them into the MOI calculation. And you see that I got a calculated experimental MOI of 0 0.0182 kilograms meters squared. So here's a comparison between our theoretical and experimental MOI values. Now for this particular wooden block test case, the theoretical value was calculated to be 0 0.0181 kilograms meters squared. Now using the bifurlar pendulum, we measured an MOI of 0 0.0182 kilograms meters squared. So the bifurlar measurement results in a pretty good match with the theory. Now, the results are not exactly the same due to factors such as a potentially non-homogeneous wood block, errors in measuring the period of oscillation, less than perfect distance and length measurements, and possibly less than perfect test sample leveling. However, for all intent and purpose, the results are really good. Now remember, LabRat is intended to be a garage lab and it is intended to inspire students and teachers to conduct their own experiments. So I'm not pushing for exact measurements and precise data just giving you an idea of how to conduct these experiments and do your own research. Well, that'll do it for this lab session. I hope you learned a little bit more about MOIs and how you can actually use a bifurlar pendulum to measure actual MOIs of test articles. Well, I hope to see you next time at LabRat Scientific.